and uh, welcome everyone to this Seed Central event. Uh, we at Harris, uh, Harris Moran Close, HM Close, uh, are very uh, glad to see everyone here, and we're very excited about Seed Central. Uh, today, it's my honor to introduce uh, our speaker tonight. I uh, had an opportunity to meet her, I guess, a, a couple of months ago uh, in, in Florida. I think it was in the middle of seemingly a tropical depression or something quite, uh, quite rainy. Uh, but uh, Dr. Florence uh, Negri Zakharov uh, received her PhD in 2005 from Purdue University in biochemistry and molecular biology. She's focused her research on uh, a very interesting aspect of, of biochemistry, looking at flavor and aroma compounds uh, applied to uh, now into fruits and vegetables. It's, to me, it's a very complex uh, chemistry that she's unraveling at, at the molecular level and looking at all the uh, interactions of these uh, compounds, which is uh, quite fascinating. I think you'll find uh, the seminar to, in the presentation today, today to be very interesting. And uh, I think we're very fortunate to have Florence here on campus and with us here tonight. So if you'll join me in welcoming uh, Florence to speak, uh, please uh, do that now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, for the nice introduction. <laughs> and uh, thank you to all the organizers of SID Central for having me tonight. Um, it's a real honor um, to speak to you about um, my research and what's really close to my heart, um, um, what I do every day, um, investigating fruit volatile metabolism. And uh, I'll try to give you some of my thoughts about um, how we can use this type of research to improve um, fruit flavor quality. Okay, so before I um, delve too much into um, um, a lot of details about the day-to-day the -day research that we do, I just wanted to bring everyone up to speed about um, quality and flavor and, and what this really means um, just to sort of um, try to make you think a little bit more about, um, about all of this. So um, when you ask people what quality means, um, you have to um, sort of take a step back and, and ask, well, where is this person in um, the pre-harvest or post-harvest chain, right? Because a good um, quality fruit is going to be to mean very different things to different people, right? Um, the farmer wants um, a variety that is, you know, resistant to disease and, and high yielding, um, you know, so many fruits in a box, that type of thing. Um, and then as you go along in the post-harvest chain, you find things like long shelf life. Um, and then when you go all the way to the consumer, um, you find that um, actually, you know, um, consumers have grown pickier and pickier with times and, and now um, they are demanding for higher quality um, flavor quality products, um, especially, I guess, if you live in California and you know exactly what I mean. <laughs> um, so, um, but I guess um, the, the take home here is that um, ultimately, um, I think that um, consumer driven um, definition of quality is really what drives marketing and drives sales, um, especially in terms of repeat buys. So when um, you ask people, well, they go to the store and um, they buy, you know, a bag of fruit and go home and it really doesn't taste good, it's, you know, full of internal breakdown and that sort of thing, they're not going to go back and in the store and buy that fruit. Um, so really, um, there's been a lot of studies done on, on this, and um, repeat buys is, is very, very correlated to flavor acceptance. Um, and this is what um, we're going to focus on tonight is, is flavor. So um, I just want to, again, bring, bring everyone up to speed on what flavor is. Um, so flavor is a very, very complicated trait, actually. Um, it, when you ask sensory scientists what is flavor, um, they'll, they'll tell you it's really an interaction of, of all these things that I've listed here. Um, so it starts with appearance, right? Um, you actually make some decisions about what 
a fruit or a vegetable will taste like just by looking at it. Um, what color is it? What shape it has? Based on uh, your previous experiences, you're, you're going to make a, a judgment already. And that can influence, actually, your perception of flavor when you eat it. Um, taste, obviously, is very important. And I'm going to focus um, um, more on, on these two attributes, taste and um, aroma, uh, which, which are very, very important. Um, and so I'll come back to those two. Um, irritation pain, that's a, the, that's a tricky one. Not all fruits and veggies um, cause that irritation or, or pain. Um, but, you know, um, a good example is when you eat chilies, um, you have this burning sensation or this pungent sensation um, on, in your mouth. And that comes from certain compounds that, um, that plants produce, like capsaicin, for example, um, in chilies. So um, texture is very important, how firm it is, um, if there is um, some mealiness to it. So all of these things will have an influence on in your overall perception of flavor. And temperature is also very important. Um, so let's talk um, about taste briefly. There's really only five taste modalities, OK? So when, when people ask you, what does it taste like, theoretically, you only have five answers, five possible answers, right? Sweet, salty, um, sour, bitter, and umami, OK? Um, so if um, we go a little bit deeper, and, and, and here I have some examples of uh, classes of compounds that um, fruits and vegetables and plants in general make um, that are responsible for um, these taste attributes. So we would have sugars um, that are responsible for this sweet um, sensation. And so all of these, um, for all of these um, taste modalities, you have receptors uh, on your tongue. And that's, that's really where you perceive all of these um, five taste modalities. So obviously, um, fruits are sweet, and that comes from the sugars that um, are contained in, in those fruits produced by these fruits. Um, just for a little tri piece of trivia, um, some proteins are extremely sweet as well. Um, monellin, tomatin are um, proteins that are produced by African um, fruits that uh, some, some countries actually use as artificial sweeteners. Um, acids are responsible for the sour taste, and this is because of the presence of acids like citric acid, um, malate, um, tartrate in, um, in grape. Um, that's not a, a good thing, typically, but um, bitter, the bitterness um, of some vegetables um, in cucumbers, for example, it comes from um, these uh, phenolic compounds um, called cucurbitacins. Limonoids are responsible for that bitterness you get um, in um, um, citrus, right? Sometimes if, um, if an orange has been um, freeze damaged, um, it'll start producing limonoids, and that's, um, that's what tastes bitter when you eat the orange. Um, salty, typically not a modality that we see um, in fruits and veggies unless you add salt, obviously. And umami, also not so present, except maybe in tomato, um, where you actually have a, a very high concentration of glutamate in the tomato. It's, it's kind of an exception um, in the fruit uh, world. But um, if you put salt on a tomato, you actually make monosodium glutamate um, naturally, so to speak. Um, so this is why um, salt on a tomato is, is delicious, because you, um, you enhance its flavor by uh, making MSG. <laughs> it surprises a lot of people, right? <laughs> um, OK, so um, let me just move on to aroma. So. Um, Remember all these um, um, flavor attributes. So we had the taste, which is really important. And then um, remember also that really you only have five taste modalities. And, and these are only coming from a very small portion of the molecules that are made um, by the plant, the sugars, the acids, um, et cetera. Aroma, on the other hand, um, comes from um, these volatile compounds that 
are produced by plants um, that come up to your nose and that you perceive um, up there in your olfactory bulb, you have um, receptors for um, these volatile compounds, and that's what induces a signal to your brain um, for um, aroma. So it also surprises people when I say it's actually, so the gene family that codes for these odor receptors is the largest family in the human genome. Um, there's about 300, over 300 of these genes that are active and that you constantly produce in your olfactory epithelium, um, and about 600 pseudogenes that sort of have decayed over time. Um, you know, we're not really, as um, mammals, we're not really um, very, we're called macrosmatic because we don't have a very good sense of smell, and that's coming from the decay of these genes um, over time compared to dogs and mice and things like that. So, um, so actually, the, your sense of smell is, is really, really crucial and very important for determining the quality of the food you eat. This is actually um, you know, one of your first um, um, reflex when you don't know if you've put a carton of milk and you've forgotten the fridge, right? And the first thing you do before you taste it is actually smelling it to see um, if, you, um, if it's going to be good to eat. So it's, um, it's actually, um, your sense of smell is very, very important. Um, and we, it also surprises most people when I say it, we have learned likes and dislikes. So a baby has absolutely no um, bias toward any particular smell and then learns um, to reject certain smells. Um, as they go along, whereas we have predetermined um, 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 likings toward taste, for example. So babies like sweet foods and, and salty foods, but not bitter, um, because that could be toxic for them. So um, there are two ways that you can smell um, or perceive aroma. Um, um, one is if you smell something, a rose or a food or anything, um, through your nose. And so the volatile compounds that are produced um, by this rose are going to go and um, be drawn up to your nose and are going to bind um, your olfactory receptors. Or you can um, perceive these when you eat. And in this particular case, you have um, a, a passage, an airway um, in the back of your mouth and um, in your throat that comes right back up to your nose, and that's called the retronasal perception of, um, of aroma. So this is how, this is why when you're, um, when you have a cold and your nose is stuck, you actually prevent this retronasal passage of aroma compounds, and that's why your, um, people say your taste perception is altered. It's actually your aroma perception that's altered. Um, but it has repercussions on your taste um, as well. Anyway, so I've been talking a lot about volatile compounds and produced by plants. So what is a volatile compound? Um, it's, a, it's an oversimplification, but um, in general, it's a small molecule that has a high tendency to evaporate. It's very nonpolar generally, so it's soluble in oils. So when we talk about essential oils, um, that's what we talk about. It's full of volatile compounds. Um, volatiles are produced naturally by plants, um, also humans. Um, and all plant parts make volatile compounds. We can also design um, some chemical reactions in a lab um, to make them. There's actually a whole industry um, around the, the synthesis or the extraction of these compounds, right? The fragrance industry and, and the flavor industry. Um, so this is what they look like. Basically, um, anything you can think about produces volatile compounds. So. Um, you, have, you have a few examples of structures here. Um, so again, tiny molecules um, with a high tendency to evaporate, that's how they get um, up to your nose. And they're in wine, obviously very, very important for um, wine flavor as well. So each volatile compound has a particular smell. 
but typically we don't experience volatile compounds as a single, um, you know, you, you don't smell beta ionone just by itself because it's present in a mixture. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. So, but just to give you a few examples, if you were to come across beta ionone by itself, it's in the aroma of a tomato, but it will be described as floral, woody, sweet, fruity, etc. So people have a very um, peculiar language to, to describe volatile um, smells, and it's not something that we're very used to. We're used to describing colors and shapes, but not so much describing smells. Um, you know, when I grew up, my mom never asked me, oh, what does this smell like? You know, it's always, oh, what's this color? What's this other color? Um, so, you know, it might, it might kind of look surprising to you and, and difficult to imagine what, a, what, what this would smell like just by reading the description. But, you know, in the end, you, you get used to it. It's kind of like tasting wine, right? You, you pick up some... Um, um, different attributes of the wine. So, um, so sometimes they, um, these volatiles can have sulfur molecules in them, um, and that's dimethyl disulfide that's in broccoli or onion. That's probably why your kids don't like broccoli, because it's got that um, oniony, sulfury smell. Um, and then um, the pyrazines are very important for green bell pepper aroma, actually. If you smelled this compound all by itself, you would be able to tell me right away, this is green bell pepper. Um, okay, so as I said, uh, an aroma is typically a mixture of many, many different volatile compounds. So tens, if it's not very complex, but the rule is, is more complexity. So um, we typically deal with hundreds of different volatile compounds in one single fruit or one single vegetable. And the thing about them is that each and every one of them has a, a particular smell, but when you put them all together, it, it, they all interact to bring you a new aroma sensation. Um, so it's a very complex thing. And for example, the aroma of a strawberry, we've um, counted over 200 volatile compounds, 200 different volatiles. And to make matters more complicated, um, our nose has different sensitivity levels to different volatiles. So um, I have an example up there. Um, what, in the aroma of a strawberry, you find um, a, a volatile compound called furanyl, um, to which we're very sensitive. So our nose can detect furanyl at very, very low levels, 10 parts per billion concentration. Whereas um, strawberries also make acetic acid, okay? so it's like vinegar, um, but we're not, we're not so sensitive to it. It actually makes more acetic acid than furanyl, but because of, of our, difference, uh, our different sensitivities to these two compounds, it's actually furanyl that's really important for um, imparting the aroma of, of the strawberry. So there's all of these things that um, play, um, come into play when, um, when you're thinking about aroma as, as, a, as a trait. So um, what do we do when uh, we say we study fruit flavors? So um, the kind of questions that we ask um, are what kinds of flavor compounds are present in fruits? How do plants make these compounds, and what do we do to the fruit to, um, that influence um, these, these processes, that influence the production of these compounds? So answering these questions um, can lead to uh, some applications. For example, um, define variety-specific or commodity-specific um, characteristics that can be related to sensory attributes. So, uh, in my work, I always um, try to go from, from the composition all the way to what compounds are really important for, um, for the particular um, sensation that we perceive. Um, and then if we understand how these compounds are made in plants, um, you could think that theoretically we could engineer some new varieties with completely new flavors, right? And 
Well, I've put the example of, of Grapple here. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. Um, it's an example of, of you know, an apple that's basically dipped in a solution that um, smells like grape. And you know, when you taste the apple, it sort of uh, has the flavor of grape. Um, but it's completely artificial, right? So if um, you knew um, all the genes that were required for making grape aroma, then you could imagine that you could transform uh, gra um, an apple and uh, make the apple um, <coughs> naturally, so to speak, um, <laughs> generate these compounds by themselves. <laughs> OK. Um, and then, um, of course, if we understand um, uh, better how we influence um, the formation of aroma through pre- and post-harvest practices, then we can better um, control flavor quality um, through the production chain. So <laughs> um, now for a little bit of an introduction about the, the kind of research that I do, um, and uh, please don't don't be scared. <laughs> this isn't so bad. Um, <laughs> so um, I guess the, the overall um, topic of, of my talk is that things are complex. <laughs> so, um, so, so this sort of um, gives you an idea of the complexity of, of the different biochemical pathways that are involved in making volatile compounds. The way I categorize volatile compounds, because I'm, I'm a biochemist, is, is um, by the way that they're produced in the, in the plant. So here it's a, it's a pretty complicated slide, but it starts with sucrose that it would be imported as uh, energy for the fruit to grow. And then the sucrose, the sugars, are just going to be broken down um, further and further and distributed um, throughout a, a, a lot of different biochemical pathways. And then along the way, you're going to be able to make these volatile compounds. Okay, so the phenylpropanoids, benzenoids, come from phenylalanine, which is an amino acid. There are other amino acids, which I'll talk about in a second, that produce other volatile compounds, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, you know, um, there's a lot of um, arrows, and, and these things um, in blue here represent genes that have been identified and that are involved in producing all of these compounds. But there are thousands of volatile compounds produced by plants, and so far we know about 10% of the genes that are involved in their synthesis. So. Um, this is by no means um, uh, the complete picture. There are a lot of holes still, um, and this is what I work on. And so on top of that, you can overlay um, even more um, complexity. And so you, know, you have the genetic factors that, that basically influence this whole pathway um, and the hormones and regulatory mechanisms that tell the plant when to make a certain compound and in one, what quantity. Um, then you have climactic factors, external factors, that will influence the production of these compounds. And what you do, um, agricultural factors, pre-harvest, the type of soil, how much you fertilize, um, et cetera. So all of these factors just sort of come as an added level of complexity to the whole system. So. Um, in my lab, we study fruit flavor, um, and one of the um, systems that we work with um, is melon. So I argue that it's a really good system for studying um, fruit flavor and aroma. Um, for one, it's very it's a it's a, a species that's highly polymorphic. So I've I have some examples down here of melons that. Um, are grown um, typically, well, maybe not this one commercially, but um, most other ones are, right? And you're familiar with, with most of them probably. This cantalupensis is the um, Charente type that we don't grow in the United States, but it's very um, prominent in France and, and Europe. They really like it over there. Um, reticulatus is the cantaloupe that we grow here, the western shippers, the eastern shippers. Um, 
And this is really what I focus on because I'm in California, and so you know this is what we grow here. Um, in Otteris would be your honeydews. Um, I have Piel de Sapo here. This is, um, I have it here that um, there are some really good genetic and genomic tools um, available. So the, the um, genome of this particular um, melon right here um, has been sequenced, and the sequence is going to come out pretty soon. So that is really, um, really good news for the melon research community because that is going to really help um, our research. So Dudime is, a, is an interesting one. It's called Queen Anne's Pocket Melon because it's so fragrant. People used to carry them around um, in the courts and uh, as a perfume. So it's, um, it's quite a neat melon. And this one is used as a cucumber. So you see there's a wide array of, um, of, of types and flavors and um, shapes. So um, when I first came, I, um, I started being interested in, in um, how much variability there was um, within the Western chipper types. Um, and here I'm just showing you an example of the, the profiles that we get from um, the aroma of, um, of certain varieties. Um, and, you know, maybe some of you <laughs> recognize the names. Um, this is how we collect volatile compounds. I'll maybe talk a little bit more about um, how we do this later, but um, this is, a, this is a, a chromatographic trace or a, a chromatogram where each peak, um, each little blip here in the line represents a volatile compound. So you can see it's very complex. There's a lot of them. Um, but overall, there's a lot of um, similarities between the, the profiles, right, between the different cultivars, and that's um, most likely because they're all more or less um, the same um, genetic material, um, so to speak. So they, the, these, um, these Western shippers definitely produce a lot of aroma. It's very diverse, um, but most of the compounds are common between cultivars. It's just that you have different ratios between compounds, and that's what makes um, each cultivar um, unique in, in the flavor pattern. But they, um, they mostly all have them, and you can see um, a list here. I know it probably doesn't tell you anything, but um, just, to, just to say that um, these the most abundant class of compounds um, is the class of asters. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those. So um, as you might imagine, as the melon grows, um, in the very beginning, it doesn't produce all of these compounds. And so as it starts developing and maturing and eventually <coughs> ripening, that's when the production of these, um, these asters begins. And so here on the um, x-axis, you have um, days after pollination. So um, in this particular case, it took 46 days to full slip, um, which means um, th when the melon is fully ripe. Um, so it starts at 35, and you see um, there is mostly m nothing um, coming out of the melon, and then as you um, go on and go through the ripening process, then um, the melon starts producing these compounds. And here on the um, bottom right corner, I have ethylene, which um, maybe a lot of you know is, is a plant hormone that um, in melon signals the, um, for the, the fruit to go through the ripening process. So um, this is actually um, a, a good and bad because um, you want to prolong the shelf life of melons by reducing the amount of ethylene that um, fruits produce typically. Um, but at the same time, it's been shown that um, ethylene actually triggers the formation of aroma. So without ethylene, you have no aroma. Um, so it's bad news, right, for the consumers because um, there's a little bit of a um, um, 
conflict of interest um, here. But so you can see very clearly the correlation um, as you start producing ethylene, you start producing volatile compounds. So in my lab, we use um, a variety of approaches um, to investigate the pathways that are involved in uh, making these volatile compounds. We use um, functional genomics, where we take advantage of um, genomic resources that have been um, developed in the community. Um, microarray, nowadays, sequencing is so, well, relatively cheap, so um, we've also started using ge next generation sequencing um, to get at these issues. And, um, but then we go um, even deeper, and, and once we have candidate genes, um, we try to understand what the gene does really in the plant, and that involves um, biochemical characterization. We put the enzyme in a tube and, um, and we see what it does. And then um, we want to know in the plant what the gene does, and so we do some um, um, knockout experiments um, to, um, to understand the function of these genes. So I won't tell you a great deal about all of this, because um, I know it's late and um, <laughs> people don't like seeing those pathways. But um, <laughs> so, um, so this, is the, this is the pathway I work on. Um, and uh, you notice here at the very end of it, you have volatile esters, um, which are the volatiles that are mostly um, made in melon. Um, and then it starts with an amino acid. I told you that there are many amino acids that give rise to these volatile esters. So part of the pathway is actually known, um, and there's been a lot of research on, on characterizing these genes. But there's um, somewhat of a black box over here, and this is what my lab has been interested in um, studying. So. Um, we, just by looking at um, different ways that the pathway could go, um, we can make hypotheses and, um, and query databases based on these hypotheses. Um, so what we can do is, um, for example, look at um, all the genes that are expressed in a melon that does not produce many volatiles, so a mature melon, um, just, because it, just before it goes through the ripening process versus all the genes that are expressed in a ripe melon, um, which expresses all of these volatile compounds, which produces all these volatile compounds. And so by comparing the two, we can um, sort of derive some candidates, um, some um, um, suspects that uh, we could say, well, you know, they are not present here, so maybe they're involved in making um, volatile compounds. So um, we do have some candidate genes that we look at, and, and um, this one is an amine oxidase, um, which we found in that its, its, its expression increases during fruit development and ripening. And this branch chain amino transferase also increases um, during the ripening. So, um, again, I was saying that um, we want to really understand really deeply what these genes do. So, we um, use um, bacteria as mini factories to make um, the enzymes that are coded by these genes. Um, and we throw at them um, a bunch of substrates, um, which, and we ask, well, will they do something with them? Um, and in this particular case, um, we have this amine oxidase here, and, and now I can draw a line there because um, we've basically identified a gene that we know carries out this reaction, which is what um, shows up here. This is the product of um, the reaction when we feed it um, this amine. So that's the kind of thing that we do. Um, another class of volatile compounds that is very important for 
aroma is um, the norisoprenoids. These compounds call, um, come from carotenoids. And carotenoids are pigments, right? The, um, the orange from the carrot or the orange from the melon um, comes from the presence of these pigments. Um, so all of these molecules are volatile compounds. The neat thing about those is that we have very, very high sensitivity for them. So even though they may be present at extremely low concentrations in the, in the fruit, um, our nose will pick them up because we, ha we are so sensitive to them. They're very important in, in some fruits. Um, they're also important in wines. And as I said, they come from the degradation of carotenoids. So here are um, um, two chromatograms showing the profile of um, volatiles coming from, here is Thompson seedless grapes, which I work on, and an apricot. And they all have these compounds that come from the degradation of carotenoids. So carotenoids can be degraded just chemically, um, naturally, or they can um, be degraded by enzymes that the plants produce. And these enzymes are called carotenoid cleavage dioxygenases, or CCDs. And what these enzymes do here on the left, you have um, pictures of the structure of carotenoid pigments. And um, what these enzymes do is they come in and they, they break um, carbon to carbon bonds within that molecule, and you end up with um, the ends there of that molecule. And this is what is volatile, and this is what your nose picks up. So those carotenoid cleavage dioxygenases actually have um, activity toward a, a wide variety of carotenoid substrates. Zeaxanthin, lutein, beta-carotene is in carrots, in melons, in, um, in many orange fruits. Um, lutein is uh, very present in those green, green fruits, so it's present in grape, the white grapes, for example. So what we do with these genes is we can um, use a very neat system where um, we have these bacteria called E. coli that um, people have engineered to produce these um, carotenoid pigments. Okay, so here on the left here you have a strain of bacteria that has been engineered to produce beta carotene. Okay, so you can grow it and it will produce a lot of beta carotene for you. If you stick that carotenoid cleavage dioxygenase gene into the bacteria, um, it will degrade those carotenoids and the bacterium will turn white because it ha no longer has um, the carotenoids. And this is what you see here. This is a control bacterium that doesn't have the CCD. And then if you throw in the CCD, you see that beta ionone um, gets produced by the breakdown of beta carotene. So um, this is another, another thing we do. And again, we, um, we know that these enzymes have very broad substrate specificity, meaning they work on a lot of different carotenoid substrates, um, which then translates into a diverse um, volatile profile that is produced by the plant. So just to summarize this part, um, we can identify and isolate genes um, involved in aroma production, and this is going on in my lab and in, in other labs um, in, throughout the world. Um, and we can start understanding the genetic mechanisms that underlie aroma uh, formation and the diversity that we see, all these hundreds of um, volatile compounds that are produced um, that come from enzyme specificity, um, substrate availability, and all these kinds of things. So it's complex, but we're starting to unravel it. Um, thankfully, because it's no longer too expensive to sequence, um, well, a genome is still expensive to sequence and difficult, but we can use um, next generation sequencing on the um, expression component of, of the 
expressed component of the genome, and that's fairly easy to do. Um, so in my opinion, the next big hurdle is really the phenotyping, because um, we can have a lot of genetic information and genome information, but really what um, hinders our ability to push forward is, is the phenotyping. And in a complex trait such as aroma, it's really critical um, to be able to phenotype fast, um, which is not the case currently. So um, my lab has also been involved in, in another project, um, um, which Bill here um, has been involved with, too. And um, that was to try to um, see and test for methods that would be more rapid for the analysis of volatile compounds, um, all the while relating that to our sensory perception and to try to see if um, those methods um, would, would be good indicators for um, good flavor quality. And so we tested this um, instrument here called the Z-Nose. It's an electronic nose. Um, the advantage of the Z-Nose is that it's portable, and it's a fast um, GC, so it's a fast gas chromatograph. Um, that's how it looks like. Um, so you have a small GC column in it, which means that you can um, actually um, separate compounds a little. Most electronic noses out there don't do any separation. So um, we think that this is, this is a little bit more powerful. Um, and the sensor is a surface acoustic wave sensor. So you can do an analysis in less than two minutes. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's very rapid. So we're talking um, the actual production of the chromatogram is um, 15 seconds. So it's extremely fast compared to the gold standard here, all those chromatograms that I've showed you throughout my talk were, were produced um, by this machine right here, very non-portable, very expensive. But it's the gold standard. It's a GCMS, a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. Um, but you have runs that can go as long as 50 minutes, and the sample prep is, is also um, relatively involved. So, you know, you can very clearly see that um, this is faster. Um, but, but you lose in resolution, right? So maybe um, you can think of it as um, QTL mapping, right? So you have a, a QTL, but you don't really know what gene in the genome. There's hundreds of genes under your QTL. Well, this is kind of like that. You have one peak here. There may be actually 10 volatiles hidden under that peak, but you just get one peak. Um, same thing with QTLs. OK. so. Um, so the question we wanted to ask, is this electronic nose capable of um, discriminating between melon uh, maturities? Um, so we did a study where we used the electronic nose on three cultivars that are um, um, HM Claus cultivars. Um, and we also coupled that with um, the gold standard um, and, um, and made some fruit quality, general fruit quality measurement and sensory analysis. And so the stages that um, we chose were two pre-slip stages where um, you don't get the abscission zone around the stem, then the green slip, a lot of force to, um, to take out that, um, that stem. Orange slip was maybe one day later, and then slip plus one day, so an array of, um, of different maturity stages. Um, so the, these are all the measurements that we um, did on all these melons. We um, looked at soluble solid content, which is a proxy for sugar um, content. We um, looked at acidity, um, texture, color, specific sugars and acids, ethylene, CO2, and volatiles. And then we did some sensory analysis on those melons as well. Um, so by a trained panel, so this isn't consumer. Um, this is really training people to describe very precisely um, what they taste. Okay, so they, um, they had these 15 um, sensory attributes, and for each of them, they scored how high 
um, the sample that they were tasting was on a scale. And so overall aroma intensity, fruit aroma. So basically what you're doing here is using people as machines to, um, to assess these particular characters of the flavor of the melon. So a, a really involved um, um, study, and this is the result of it. Um, so kind of uh, <laughs> difficult to read, but um, the, the, the points, each point represents a variety and a maturity stage. So on the left here, all the um, less mature, less ripe cultivars cluster. And then as you go um, through the ripening process, um, all the ripe green slip, orange slip, slip plus one cluster on the right. Um, and this is based on the Zeno's data. So here you have early mature and ripe so we have a nice separation of the, comp, um, the samples on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, we have separation according to cultivar at the ripe stage. So um, Navigator was up here, and Masrico and Thunderbird were down there. Those were the three varieties we were working with. So now if you remember this um, map, then we can sort of um, virtually overlay this map with um, all the peaks that we found in the electronic nose. And you can see that you have the peaks out there, uh, oops, on the left that represent the peaks that were higher in the less mature cultivars. And the peaks on the right would be higher in the more um, ripe cultivars. And then, um, you have a separation, peak seven and peak 12 would be higher in Navigator, and peak eight and peak 13 would be higher in Masrico and Thunderbird. So we actually did find some really good candidates, at least for maturity, um, to separate um, those melons out. Um, and so these would be good, good um, markers um, that we can use with the Xenos to detect maturity. And I, and I expect that um, we would see if we threw in uh, more cultivars, we would see other peaks that would be very specific to cultivars as well. So um, if we add all of the measurements that we did, that was just looking at the Xenos. Um, what we did is um, we as I said, we, um, we took a gazillion measurements, um, texture, sugars, um, ethylene, volatiles. There were over 100 different volatiles per sample. So it was a lot of data. But if you overlay everything um, onto a, a multivariate analysis um, and you ask, well, can um, the volatile from the gold standard predict um, the xenos, the um, physical chemical attributes and the sensory, you find this map which essentially um, clusters all the cultivars that were less ripe. Now on the right, it kind of flipped, but it's it's okay. <laughs> um, and then on the left, you have all the um, attributes that correspond to the ripe varieties. Um, and so if you zoom in, if you zoom in on this particular portion right here, um, what you find is that all the um, sensory attributes that represent that it would be high in a ripe melon, so fruity, sweet, buttery aroma, color intensity, all of these sensory attributes cluster with volatile compounds. So we have um, um, Zeno's compounds here, Zeno's peaks, that we can use now as marker for specific sensory attributes. Um, but really what I would like you to notice on this slide is, is um, the absence of sugar. So um, in this particular experiment, 
uh, we did not see a very strong correlation between sugar content and, um, and these sensory attributes, especially sweet taste, which, um, you know, it's sort of um, me jumping on my soapbox and saying volatiles are really important <laughs> because, um, you know, what most people do is uh, really look at the sugar content of um, fruits um, to determine their quality, and, and there's really a lot more to, um, to flavor than just the sugars, okay? And this is um, a rather complicated way of um, telling you all this, but hopefully <laughs> that's the take-home message. So um, to summarize, um, we think we, we have an instrument that's a, a promising tool for um, assessing um, and phenotyping um, cultivars or, um, you know, fruits based on maturity. Um, and aroma volatiles are better descriptors and, and predictors for um, flavor attributes. And I should say, though, that the sugar differences were ra rather small in this particular set. So maybe um, that's more true when you have sugar differences that are not so big, then the volatiles are really important. But when we're thinking about breeding for higher sweetness, then maybe if you've reached the maximum potential of your variety, then maybe you can turn your attention to volatiles and by um, increasing or, or um, giving it a, a slightly different aroma profile, you may influence the perception of sweetness without actually, um, without actually changing the sugar content of your cultivar. So um, I'm almost done. I, I hope I've convinced you that um, flavor is a complicated business. Um, but that, you know, really it's the integration of all of these different approaches that are going to um, move us forward in, in understanding aroma better and hopefully eventually um, use all of these tools um, to breed for better flavor. Um, again, always with having the end consumer in mind um, for flavor quality. So. Before I close, I just want to briefly mention this um, electronic nose project was funded um, through a USDA specialty crops research initiative project. That's a multi-institution, um, multi-state, multi-everything project. Um, we're over 30 different uh, investigators on the project. It's led here at UC Davis by um, Beth Mitchum and um, at the University of Florida by Jeff Brecht. Um, and so I'm part of, of this big team of people that are essentially trying to um, find ways to deliver um, better tasting um, produce to consumers. If you want to know more about it, that's the website. Uh, and I'm part of objective two, which is methods for measuring maturity and quality. So that electronic nose story was part of that. Um, and I'm collaborating with Sue Ebler on this study. Um, but part of the study um, was actually going out to the industry and asking people, well, do you agree with our um, rationale? Because we think that handling fruits better will result in higher quality product. And so we went out and, and we asked growers and shippers and packers and um, retailers if they agreed with the logic. So the logic one was better handling results in better taste. Um, and we had uh, overall quite a, quite, a, quite a good agreement with that logic, uh, with some people um, disagreeing a little bit. So, you know, the positive reactions are here, but I just want to point out that um, the people who disagreed with the logic really pointed out that variety di dictates taste or flavor, and that variety and harvesting time makes the big difference. So I'm throwing it out there to you um, because it's very, very um, 
I think there is a realization that really the, the genotype and the, the genetic material, you can't go beyond that. If your variety is not good tasting, no matter what you do um, during the production and post-harvest, it's not going to get better, right? So um, with that, I'll um, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, there is a lot of people um, to thank, so all um, the members of my lab, Min Min and Zhang Lei um, and Simona, are part of the Mellon project. Um, and um, Yi Chia works on the keratin with cleavage dioxygenase. Um, Sharon Koi and Scott are undergraduates in my lab that work very hard um, to help us with all these samples. Um, thank you very, very much to all the collaborators. Bill is in the audience. Um, we work also with Jean Poulos on some other Mellon um, projects. And um, yeah, the funding comes from the USDA um, and the generous help of um, HM Claus. <laughs> so um, with that, thank you for your attention again, and um, I'll be happy to answer questions. Well, thank you very much, Florence. I mean, it's, it's really remarkable how much is going on in fruit development and then how much we, uh, what's going on in our own biochemistry to understand the flavor and, and fragrances, volatiles that come off the fruit. Um, so those of you who have written questions, if you could uh, pass those maybe towards uh, Francois over on that end. And in the meantime, uh, we can open up the floor for any questions that anyone might have. So I'm going to run around with the microphone. And yeah, I have a couple of questions based on, on things that you mentioned along the way. Uh, early on, you showed us some aroma compounds being produced in melons, and you were talking about days after full bloom and things like that. Uh, is there any, do, do melons attract pollinators, or, or are they self-pollinating? I'm demonstrating my ignorance. <laughs> and if they do attract them, are there aroma compounds associated with that, and are there any relationships between hmm. the aroma compounds that might be involved in attracting pollinators and which in the end attract seed dispersal organisms? Right. <laughs> That's a good question. So um, they don't self. They, they, have to, they have to be pollinated by bees or by um, uh, breeders. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so they, they do, I mean, they do attract um, pollinators. I'm not very familiar. I sh it's kind of a shame because that's my background is in flower um, production, um, scent production. But um, I know that the, the, in the very beginning when I was here, I did a profiling of, of melon flowers. And the profiles are extremely different. So... Um, they don't produce esters, so the, um, there are very different compounds that are involved in attracting, but I haven't really seen any studies per se identifying which compounds are important, but that's a really good point. I mean, those, those volatiles in, produced in flowers are really important for attracting pollinators. Um, and so that's, that's their function. That's why we think the, um, the plants make them in the first place. Um, and in fruits, again, there's really little um, to suggest that that's um, a mechanism for attracting seed dispersers. But um, I haven't talked about that, but um, um, early on in the development of the melon, actually they produce another set of volatile compounds, so no esters, but they produce compounds that have been shown to have antimicrobial or antifungal activities, and so um, biologists think that you know it's a way for the the fruit to protect its seeds before um, it's just ready to be disseminated, right? So, and then as the as the seeds are ready then they start advertising with this huge amount of volatile compounds to potential seed dispersers, which would be us in that case, but... <laughs> One other question yeah. that may not be quite so, uh, so complicated. 
and, and some of the things that you were saying made me think of it. You know, initially I would have thought that enhancing the, the aroma of a ripe fruit would depend on causing the fruit to make more of a particular characteristic compound. But in fact, there's a lot of combination stuff going on. And is it conceivable that you could enhance the aroma by knocking something out? It could be, yeah, it could be. So <laughs> that's a really good point. I mean, and that's why, that's why it's extremely complex because, um, y you know, you, I mean, sensory scientists just do a lot of reconstitution experiments where they look at the hundreds of compounds and then they start taking one at a time and reconstituting the aroma and eventually they come up with a, a, a very limited number of compounds that are actually important um, for for the particular aroma so you can you can make a case that maybe by removing some compounds you take away some interactions and it might actually result in a better flavor um, overall so I mean there are some um, um, some volatiles that produce off odors, okay, so they're not always good. Um, and so uh, there are a lot of volatiles that come, that are produced um, as a result of fermentative metabolism, so that's really a, a problem in post-harvest because if you put the fruits under a controlled atmosphere, low oxygen, high CO2, which prolongs the shelf life, um, you may induce fermentative metabolism, which in turn induces the production of, of compounds that really don't smell all that good. And then those compounds you will detect. Or when you open a bag of lettuce and it smells funky, well, th that's, that's basically what it is. It's those volatile compounds coming from fermentation, um, if fermentation occurred in the bag. So, um, so you know, I mean, that's a, that's a really good example of if we knew um, exactly how they were made, and we can control um, their production and reduce their production. Then we could um, we could help out with the flavor. Yeah. So Florence, are there volatiles that are made that aren't perceived as aromas? And if so, what would they do? <laughs> oh, um, I I believe that um, you know I mean. Ethylene, for example, we, ca we can't really smell it unless it's produced at extremely high concentrations. So at physiological concentrations in the fruit, our nose cannot smell. But, you know, um, we have ethylene, ethylene tanks in the lab um, just for research, and it smells. So pretty much any volatile has a smell um, if, you, if you have a high enough concentration. Now. Okay, <laughs> so there are things called pheromones, which plants, well, plants are not known to produce um, human pheromones, but they are known to produce insect pheromones, um, and those typically our nose is not very sensitive to. So we have receptors for pheromones, but they don't induce, so the binding of those volatiles to those receptors don't induce a, a, an aroma sensation. They, you know, they can trigger some specific behavior. <laughs> but, but, um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's an example. But, but as far as I know, plants have not been shown to produce human pheromones. <laughs> yeah. Questions, more questions from the audience? Wow. <laughs> Was it? Well, let's show a few more pathways and maybe we can... Yeah. Right. <laughs> a lot more questions. <laughs> well, I think I'm going to turn it over to Francois. Thank you. Thank you again, Florence. Uh, great <laughs> also surprises people when I say it's actually, so the gene family that codes for these odor receptors is the largest family in the human genome. Um, there's about 300, over 300 of these genes that are active and that you constantly produce in your olfactory epithelium, um, and about 600 pseudogenes that sort of have decayed over time um, 
you know, we're not really, as um, mammals, we're not really um, very, we're called macrosmatic because we don't have a very good sense of smell, and that's coming from the decay of these genes um, over time compared to dogs and mice and things like that. So, um, so actually, the, your sense of smell is, is really, really crucial and very important for determining the quality of the food you eat. This is actually um, you know, one of your first um, um, reflex when you don't know if you've put a carton of milk and you've forgotten the fridge, right? And the first thing you do before you taste it is actually smelling it to see um, if, you, um, if it's going to be good to eat. So it's, um, it's actually um, your sense of smell is very, very important. Um, and we, it also surprises most people when I say it, we have learned likes and dislikes. So a baby has absolutely no um, bias toward any particular smell and then learns um, to reject certain smells um, as they go along, whereas we have predetermined um, 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 likings toward taste, for example. So babies like sweet foods and, and salty foods, but not bitter, um, because that could be toxic for them. So um, there are two ways that you can smell um, or perceive aroma. Um, um, one is if you smell something, a rose or a food or anything, um, through your nose. And so the volatile compounds that are produced um, by this rose are going to go and um, be drawn up to your nose and are going to bind um, your olfactory receptors. Or you can um, perceive these when you eat. And in this particular case, you have um, a, a passage, an airway already, and that can influence actually your perception of flavor when you eat it. Um, taste, obviously, is very important, and I'm going to focus um, um, more on, on these two attributes, taste and um, aroma, uh, which, which are very, very important. Um, and so I'll come back to those two. Um, irritation pain, that's a... That's a tricky one. Not all fruits and veggies um, cause that irritation or, or pain. Um, but you know, um, a good example is when you eat chilies, um, you have this burning sensation or this pungent sensation um, on, in your mouth. And that comes from certain compounds that, um, that plants produce, like capsaicin, for example, um, in chilies. So um, texture is very important, how firm it is, um, if there is um, some mealiness to it. So all of these things will have an influence on your overall perception of flavor. And temperature is also very important. Um, so let's talk um, about taste briefly. There's really only five taste modalities. Okay? So when, when people ask you what does it taste like, theoretically you only have five answers, five possible answers, right? Sweet, salty, um, sour, bitter, and umami, okay? Um, so if um, we go a little bit deeper, and, and, and here I have some examples of uh, classes of compounds that um, fruits and vegetables and plants in general make um, that are responsible for um, these taste attributes. So we would have sugars um, that are responsible for this sweet um, sensation, and so all of these, um, for all of these um, taste modalities, you have receptors uh, on your tongue, and that's that's really where you perceive all of these um, five taste modalities. So obviously, um, fruits are sweet, and that comes from the sugars that um, are contained in in those fruits produced by these fruits. Um, just for a little tri piece of trivia, um, some proteins are extremely sweet as well. Um, monellin, tomatin are um, proteins that are produced by African um, fruits that uh, some, some countries actually use as artificial sweeteners. Um, acids are responsible for the sour taste, and this is because of the presence of acids like citric acid, um, malate, um, tartrate in, um, in grape. Um, that's not a good thing, typically, but um, bitter, the bitterness um, of some vegetables 
um, in cucumbers, for example, it comes from um, these uh, phenolic compounds um, called cucurbitacins. Limonoids are responsible for that bitterness you get um, in um, um, citrus, right? Sometimes if, um, if an orange has been um, freeze damaged, um, it'll start producing limonoids and that's, um, that's what tastes bitter when you eat the orange. Um, salty, typically not a modality that we see um, in fruits and veggies unless you add salt, obviously. And umami, also not so present, except maybe in tomato, um, where you actually have a, a very high concentration of glutamate in the tomato. It's, it's kind of an exception um, in the fruit uh, world. But um, if you put salt on a tomato, you actually make monosodium glutamate um, naturally, so to speak. Um, so this is why um, salt on a tomato is, is delicious, because you, um, you enhance its flavor by uh, making MSG. <laughs> it surprises a lot of people, right? <laughs> um, OK, so um, let me just move on to aroma. So. Um, Remember all these um, um, flavor attributes. So we had the taste, which is really important. And then um, remember also that really you only have five taste modalities, and, and these are only coming from a very small portion of the molecules that are made um, by the plant, the sugars, the acids, um, etc. Aroma, on the other hand, um, comes from um, these volatile compounds that are produced by plants um, that come up to your nose and that you perceive um, up there in your olfactory bulb, you have um, receptors for um, these volatile compounds, and that's what induces a signal to your brain um, for um, aroma. So it, um, when you ask people what quality means, um, you have to um, sort of take a step back and, and ask, well, where is this person in um, the pre-harvest or post-harvest chain, right? Because a good um, quality fruit is going to be to mean very different things to different people, right? Um, the farmer wants um, a variety that is, you know, resistant to disease and, and high yielding. Um, you know, so many fruits in a box, that type of thing. Um, and then as you go along in the post-harvest chain, you find things like long shelf life. Um, and then when you go all the way to the consumer, um, you find that um, actually, you know, um, consumers have grown pickier and pickier with times, and, and now um, they are demanding for higher quality um, flavor quality products, um, especially, I guess, if you live in California and you know exactly what I mean. <laughs> um, so, um, but I guess um, the, the take home here is that um, ultimately, um, I think that um, consumer driven um, definition of quality is really what drives marketing and drives sales, um, especially in terms of repeat buys. So, when um, you ask people, well, they go to the store and um, they buy, you know, a bag of fruit and go home and it really doesn't taste good, it's, you know, full of internal breakdown and that sort of thing, they're not going to go back and in the store and buy that fruit. Um, so really, um, there's been a lot of studies done on, on this and um, repeat buys is, is very, very correlated to flavor acceptance. Um, and this is what um, we're going to focus on tonight is, is flavor. So um, I just want to, again, bring, bring everyone up to speed on what flavor is. Um, so flavor is a very, very complicated trait, actually. Um, it, when you ask sensory scientists what is flavor, um, they'll, they'll tell you it's really an interaction of, of all these things that I've listed here. Um, so it starts with appearance, right? Um, you actually make some decisions about what a fruit or a vegetable will taste like just by looking at it. Um, what color is it? What shape it has based on uh, your previous experiences. You're, you're going to make a, a judgment. And uh, welcome everyone to this Seed Central event. Uh, we at Harris, uh, Harris Brand Close, HM Close, 
uh, are very uh, glad to see everyone here, and we're very excited about Seed Central. Uh, today, it's my honor to introduce uh, our speaker tonight. I uh, had an opportunity to meet her, I guess, a, a couple of months ago uh, in, in Florida. I think it was in the middle of seemingly a tropical depression or something quite, uh, quite rainy. Uh, but uh, Dr. Florence uh, Negrius Zakharov. Uh, received her PhD in 2005 from Purdue University in biochemistry and molecular biology. She's focused her research on uh, a very interesting aspect of, of biochemistry, looking at flavor and aroma compounds uh, applied to uh, now into fruits and vegetables. It's a, to me, it's a very complex uh, chemistry that she's unraveling at, at the molecular level and looking at all the uh, interactions of these uh, compounds, which is uh, quite fascinating. I think you'll find uh, the seminar to, in the presentation today, today to be very interesting. And uh, I think we're very fortunate to have Florence here on campus and with us here tonight. So if you'll join me in welcoming uh, Florence to speak, uh, please uh, do that now. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, um, for the nice introduction. <laughs> and uh, thank you to all the organizers of SID Central for having me tonight. Um, it's a real honor um, to speak to you about um, my research and what's really close to my heart, um, um, what I do every day, um, investigating fruit volatile metabolism. And uh, I'll try to give you some of my thoughts about um, how we can use this type of research to improve um, fruit flavor quality. Okay, so before I um, delve too much into um, um, a lot of details about the day-to-day the -day research that we do, I just wanted to bring everyone up to speed about um, quality and flavor and, and what this really means, um, just to sort of um, try to make you think a little bit more about, um, about all of this. So 